if your kids have never shared a room before, it can be a really scary prospect. No one wants to ruin sleep. But there are things you can do to make it more successful and you can get there. There are many, many children throughout the course of history, ancient and recent, who have shared rooms and there are things you can do. So in this video, we will talk about the tips to get room sharing under control and have your kids sleeping well. But first, introductions. Hello, my name is Valerie. I have been vlogging since the year 2007. I have four children who currently range in age from 10 to 17 years old, and I love helping parents love parenting. My first tip is to have the right kids share. Now, this is applicable if you have an option. We didn't need to share rooms until we had our fourth child coming, so we needed two of our four children to share. At first, we tried having our second and third children share. They're both girls. Our oldest is a boy, and I didn't want the baby sharing a room because I wanted the baby to be undisturbed while she learned how to sleep. So, child number two, child number three seemed like a great idea, but it wasn't. Our third child, she was two years old, turning three, she just has always loved people. She loves to party. She loves to talk and talk and talk. She also sang herself to sleep every night. That was like her self-soothing technique was to sing herself to sleep. And so her sharing a room was very disruptive to her older sister. So we tried that for a few months and her, the oldest of the two, Caitlin, was about to start kindergarten. And after a couple of months, Caitlin said to me, Mommy, I just really want to sleep. And I just thought, this poor girl cannot start kindergarten and not be able to sleep at night. And we'd given it a good try, and I needed to go back to the drawing board, and I decided to have my first two children share. They were both older. They were both really great at following directions. They both liked to sleep. So Brayden and Caitlin shared, and... It worked out very well with no issues. It was super smooth and seamless. Of course, going through the two months of difficulty allowed it so I had some great tips for you and understood the difficulty of room sharing. But in retrospect, I should have thought ahead and thought about who actually is going to be best at sharing a room. So one thing to think about is who has similar sleep needs. If you have one child who's a low sleep needs and a child who's a high sleep needs, that might not work out so well. If your high sleep needs child is woken up by your low sleep needs child getting up in the morning, then suddenly there's not as much sleep happening for this high sleep needs child. And we all know that that leads to tantrums, disobedience, uh, difficulty being alert during the day. So that's not ideal. If you have no choice, there are ways to work around it, like sending the high sleep needs child to bed earlier or requiring your low sleep needs child to wait in bed quietly a little later in the morning if that is an option. So there are things you can do. If, if you have no choice, then you just have to brainstorm and think of the best solution to make it work the best you can. Along the same line, I would think about who has similar schedules. So if you have two children who are waking up for school, then that makes sense for them to share because they can get up at the same time and get ready for school. Whereas if you have one going to school and one who doesn't, they don't necessarily both need to wake up at the same time. It's also nice to have either similar bedtimes or compatible bedtimes because you can stagger bedtimes, which we'll talk about a little later in the video. You can either send them to bed at the same time or stagger enough that they both get the sleep they need, then that is fantastic. And I also would choose your two best listeners, the two who are going to follow the rules, the two who are the most obedient for you at this current time. My second tip is to prepare your children mentally. Uh, people kind of struggle with things like big changes in life when they are just sprung on them last minute. You don't want to say, hey, guess what? Today you're starting room sharing. You're going to share with your sibling. Isn't that going to be great? Even, you know, some kids might be like, oh yeah, that's great. But a lot are going to have questions. They're going to be a little nervous. They haven't had time to think about this. What does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, so it's good to give them some heads up. Also good to talk about, hey, you're going to share a room. This is the day it's going to happen. Let's mark it on the calendar. Let's make a countdown chain. 
uh, here are the rules that are going to, to be in place. And so they can start thinking about these things. My third tip is to prepare the room so that it is there for both children. If you're like me, then you're moving one child in with another child. And so the child who already was in that room, the room was decorated for that child. And so as I prepared for room sharing, we decorated the room so that it would match both kids, so that it had both of their interests, both of them represented, so that it was a bedroom that belonged to both of them. And so the other one didn't just feel like a guest or a visitor. My fourth tip is to prepare the sleep environment so that it's ideal for both people as much as possible. Now, anyone who shares a room with a spouse or partner knows that a lot of times we have different sleep needs for our sleep environment. And this can be true in your children as well. One of your children might like a really cold room at night and one might like it a little warmer. And so you have to figure out how do we make this work for both of them. Um, in this case, if one likes it warmer than the other, then the one who likes it warmer can just have an extra blanket or two on the bed. So think about, just like you would with your spouse, think about how you can make that sleep environment work for both people. So we're looking at room temperature, we're looking at light. There's one child really need it really dark while the other one is fine either way. Another thing I would highly recommend, at least at first, is a white noise machine. Some people really worry about using white noise because they worry about creating a habit. But our first goal right now is to get your kids to be able to sleep well. And if they hear every noise the other one's making, they might not sleep well. Now, you don't have to go straight to white noise. You can try it without. This is especially true if you're able to move to room sharing at a time when they're able to get less sleep and that's okay. Like maybe it's a weekend, maybe it's the summer. You know, they may get used to each other quickly and that's fine. But if they struggle, really consider using the white noise machine. This is especially helpful if they wake up at different times or if you are staggering bedtimes. Something else I would highly recommend is a bunk bed. When your children are in a bunk bed, they cannot see each other. And so they're more likely to just go to sleep rather than looking over and be like, look, there's my buddy that I love to play with and talk to, so let's hang out. That's way more fun than sleeping. So bunk bed is a great thing for making room sharing a little easier. In your preparations, you want to also establish rules. Some of the rules we had included never wake a sleeping sibling, stay in your bed until you are allowed to get up, and use your whisper voice. So think about what rules you'd like to have, establish those, keep them simple, only do a few, make sure they're clear, and talk to your children about them. Now my next tip is you need consequences. You can't have rules that are effective unless there are consequences for not following those rules. So what is going to happen if you do not follow the rule? Make sure it's meaningful to your child there's no like, this is the answer for room sharing. Just like during the day, you, you already have an idea of what works for your child and what doesn't. But I will say with our first two children that we had tried to room share with, with Caitlin and McKenna, if McKenna would not be quiet and let Caitlin go to sleep, then we moved her out of the room. We started the room sharing idea before Brinley was here so that we had time to get them adjusted so we had an extra room still and if McKenna wouldn't be quiet we'd move her into another room and that worked well like she did not like that she wanted to be in the room with Caitlin and so it would work for a little bit but it did not work long term so that's an idea to try but just think of something that will be a consequence to your child that will be meaningful to your child that will elicit change something that can work really well is a lights out idea if you have a lights out rule, then what you do is you put your children to bed 10 to 30 minutes before you actually want them to go to sleep. And you leave the lights on or leave them dim or a lamp on. And it's smart to keep the light dim so that it gets that time to sleep going on and let that melatonin release. But you have that the lights dim and you allow your children to talk to each other or to read quietly, do something quiet in the bed for 10 to 30 minutes. And then after the time that you've decided, 10 to 30 minutes, you go in and you turn the lights out. And once lights are out, 
no talking is allowed. So you allow some talking, some visiting. So this is great because it allows there to be some visiting, some bonding, which is a huge benefit of sharing a room, is that you get to bond with each other. And so it allows there to be some of that fun of room sharing while still respecting the need for sleep and making sure sleep happens. So it's a good like win-win situation. I alluded to this earlier, but my next tip is to start room sharing when sleep can be afforded to be lost. You want to start in the summer, on a school break, over a holiday, on a weekend. So think about when is it going to be more okay. You don't want to start room sharing two days before family pictures unless you want family pictures to go rougher than family pictures usually go. So you want to make sure you are setting everyone up for success and, and start at a time that it's going to be okay for your children to have less sleep than is desirable. You also don't want your decisions to be driven by worrying about getting sleep. You want to be able to make logical decisions without worrying about like, if this doesn't happen, then sleep's not gonna happen, and then da 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 da. You want to just be like, well, I knew they weren't going to get as much sleep as they should, and I plan for this, and it's okay. My final tip for success is to stagger bedtimes. This is what you want to do if the lights out idea doesn't work, if you still have a child who is chatty chatty, after the lights are out, then you stagger bedtime. What you want to do is put the child to bed first, who falls asleep the fastest. So you, hopefully this is the younger child because usually the older child is not happy about going to bed before the younger sibling, right? So if you can put the younger child to bed first and then wait 20 to 30 minutes and then put the older child to bed, then typically your older child usually is going to be better about being quiet better able to quietly move about the room, to not try to wake up their sibling, whereas a younger child oftentimes is going to be okay with waking up the sibling so that they can chat. <laughs> so that's a great thing to do if you're struggling with getting that quiet time, and that could even be a consequence. Like you can go to bed at the same time if you do not talk once lights are out, but if you do talk, then we're going to stagger bedtime. And so. Going to bed at the same time can be a reward for following rules. If the first child who goes to sleep is a very light sleeper, then that's when you really consider bringing in the white noise machine. You can even just turn it on for when you put the first child to bed and then turn it off once the second child is tucked in and settled or you could go in later before you went to bed and turn the white noise machine off. Those are my tips for room sharing. It can be a difficult transition and process, but it will work out. Keep brainstorming, troubleshooting, work within the parameters that you have, be flexible with the things you can be flexible with, and everything will work out great. If you have questions, as always, drop them in the comments and I will answer. Have a great day and thanks for watching.